Hey everyone, this is Alex. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge Podcast. There is no such thing as an assault weapon. Okay, what people don't realize is that this law is still coming. And mm. what gets me is the anti-gun people on the left side decided to go after litigation and just try to pass another ban. We have to start working together instead of against each other. Now, we don't have to have the same policies, right? But what we can be clear on is what the Second Amendment is for and no more further attacks, no more limitations and restrictions. Hey everyone, Alex today filling in for Reagan and Ben as they carry out their wonderful legislative duties. Uh, today, we're really excited to have uh, Monty Bowen, who is from Gun Owners of America. Uh, Monty is the Pacific Regional Director of the organization and also has quite the uh, long history and career in law enforcement, which he goes into more detail on in the episode. And the reason we wanted to have this episode is because we had uh, the Oregon chapter leader on before of Moms Demand Action. Uh, of course, Moms Demand Action is uh, an organization that promotes, you know, more gun regulations, kind of policies in that manner. And GOA is the complete opposite organization. They uh, describe themselves as the, quote, only no compromise gun lobby uh, or gun rights organization based in Washington, D.C. And uh, we talk about a host of issues within this episode. Uh, you know, I tried to really bring out kind of the more, uh, I guess, pro-gun perspective, just kind of as a contrast to the to the Moms Demand Action on some of those things. But the thing that is just really interesting to me in this episode is specifically how GOA, and GOA, by the way, is the organization who filed the lawsuit, which is currently holding Measure 114 from being implemented, uh, which, you know, of course, is just incredible to me that Oregon voters had approved something an outside group comes in with legal action and basically stops the lawsuit right in its tracks. And this is something uh, we, I know I talked a little bit about on a previous episode that you're going to be seeing a lot more on the right, on the left, pro, you know, pro-life, pro-abortion, pro-gun, whatever the cause might be. There's going to be a lot more litigation uh, heading into the future to, you know, kind of decide political outcomes. And uh, the, the background that Monty describes it in is truly amazing. Uh, it's really interesting. They also talk about uh, another potential lawsuit to come, which may actually impact uh, Oregon SB 348, which is a uh, gun that, or what, excuse me, not a gun, uh, a bill that puts more regulation on firearms that is currently working its way uh, to the governor's desk and may actually be signed by the time this podcast is published. So I uh, hope you enjoy the episode. I hope it definitely uh, provokes some thoughts, no matter where you, you know, fall on this issue. Uh, you know, thanks again for uh, taking the time to listen, definitely check out the episode on YouTube as well, and we'll see you in the episode. Harang Long PC has always recognized that achieving our clients' goals sometimes requires a change in the law. And in other situations, clients need help stopping or changing proposed amendments to the law that put their interests at risk. For decades, we have played a role in shaping Oregon law on many subjects, from narrow regulations to major policy changes implicating billions of dollars. Our lawyers work with clients to draft legislation, prepare legal opinions and testimony to share with legislators, coordinate with professional lobbyists, and work directly with policymakers. To learn more about Harang Long's policy and politics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G.com. Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge. Uh, today, you just have Alex, but of course, we're still in for a great episode. And it's my pleasure to introduce Monty Bowen from Gun Owners of America. Monty, how's it going today? Doing good, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. And uh, so I know GOA is, of course, we'll talk just in a little bit about uh, the organization, its history and its footprint. But uh, yeah. where are you located at right now? Right now, I'm currently in the great state of Tennessee. It's my home base state, and uh, we're just out here seeing some grandbabies, so enjoying enjoying a little bit of time home. Awesome. Yeah, I've been to, well, I guess I've been to Tennessee twice, but uh, one, I was so little, I don't really remember it, but uh, I just went to Nashville previously for a conference. Uh, 
got got to go to Boot Barn. That was quite the experience in Nashville. And then, uh, of course, saw the gajillion bachelorette parties that go on there. So uh, any ladies who who are engaged, Nashville is clearly popping when it comes to uh, when it comes to place for bachelorette parties. So it's one uh, of the tops, I think. Yeah, no, that would not surprise me. So, uh, so yeah, Monty, really excited to have you uh, on the show. And yeah, before we get started, uh, let's hear a little bit more about your background. I know that you know you yeah. served for, I believe, thirty or more than thirty years in law enforcement. Can you just talk to us to a little bit about uh, your career in law enforcement, kind of what that entailed, and then uh, also what your role is at uh, Gun Owners of America? Absolutely. Yeah, I started back in. Uh, geez, sometimes I have to double check and think, but it was back in ninety. 92. And I decided to, at the age of 18, go through the police academy. And in the great state of Tennessee, they thought, yeah, sure, we'll let you go through uh, the police academy and become a police officer at a young age. And I'll tell you, Alex, I, I always laugh about, and we will talk about it when we get into the, the ballot measure 114, but they always want to strip the rights away from an 18 to a 20-year-old. And we're faced with that day and day. I can tell you as living proof, when I started being a police officer at the age of 18, the best thing I had was a was a gun because I was very over responsible with it. The worst thing they did was give me a fast car with blue lights. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's just being honest. That was probably one of the worst things they ever gave me. I was very responsible with a gun. But hey, when you got a police car, sky's the limit on the speed, right? Going to calls. I, I was gonna say I've I've seen some uh, not well not in Tennessee but across the I've seen some questionable police driving before so uh, yeah that, oh a- absolutely it could also I, certainly be a weapon I'm sure yeah <laughs> so um, I started as a reserve officer and working in the jail and I did part time um, both areas so I was a part time jail correction officer and then I went into and did part time in the road because basically in Tennessee, it was very political. So you had to kind of show your worth and do a lot of free work to get into the high. So in 19, early 94, I went full-time and then I did spend 30 years. I've worked every division from road to road supervisor to a detective, worked homicides, worked suicides, worked a lot of mental cases. I worked child sex crimes, one of the worst parts of my entire career. And then I also ran, um, a patrol division, went over, ran that for a while. And then I also ran and commanded a special ops team for over 20 years. So wow, the okay. last, yeah, the last part of my career, I spent training officers. So I was very um, recognized in the state of Tennessee as a master instructor. So I can write my own plans. I can write my own, change my own uh, uh, learning lessons and stuff like that. So then uh, after we had a, quite a few of the BLM riots come up in the rural areas and uh, took a couple of injuries from, from those and decided, you know what, I've got my time in, let's go ahead and retire. So I went ahead and took my full retirement after 30 years and then moved on. And of course, like always, you know, what's my next step? And I was introduced to GOA and I joined GOA three years ago and have been involved in gun control because that's the one thing I always worked for a constitutional sheriff. So, mm-hmm. you know, my, my, my whole background in law enforcement was bound by what our constitutional rights were. And believe it or not, even in the state of Tennessee back in the early 90s, you had to be 21 to purchase a pistol. And mm-hmm. this is a funny story. And my dad bought my first gun so I could go and protect and serve the citizens of our county. So it's kind of ironic that my dad had to purchase a weapon because at that time the department didn't purchase that because it was funding and stuff like that. So, you know, eventually later the federal laws caught up with Tennessee and they said, Nope, you can't do this. And they all purchased our weapons, but it kind of a funny, fun fact back in the day, that's how, that's how things went down. So yeah. And and that, yeah. No, that that's uh that, no, that is definitely interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. not providing law enforcement officers, uh, uh, service weapons. That's uh, that, yeah, not for, something I heard before. So I guess you you learned yeah, for four, uh, four years. Yeah, four years. That for four years I did that. We bought our own weapons. Everybody had a genre of weapons from semi-automatic, forty calibers, nine millimeters, forty fives to revolvers. So it was a hosh posh of stuff. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. So, uh, so talk, so ta- uh, talking about you know, kind of moving over to to GOA yeah. and the organization itself. So I think. Uh, you know, and I was kind of giving you the, you know, that the profile of our average listener. And I thought one thing yeah. I found that they might find particularly 
interesting is that uh, GOA describes itself as, if I'm not mistaken, the quote, no compromise gun rights organization. So Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about, because I, I think to at least some of our viewers who maybe aren't as kind of educated, either, you know, yeah. either pro-gun or, or, you know, pro-gun restriction, whatever they might be, they might think that the NRA, you know, like they don't compromise on anything, you know, or maybe there's the NJRA, if I'm not mistaken, the other one, mm -hmm. right? What is what does that mean by, you know, how, like how does GOA kind of make itself different than another organization like NRA or something like that? Yeah, well, what makes us different is on the no compromise. And basically what I like to tell people how I explain that is we, we're here to protect, defend, and restore our Second Amendment right. Our Constitution was laid out, and it's, it's like I tell people, the 27 words in the Second Amendment are absolute. There is no, there, there, our forefathers took a week to decide the word infringe. That's how important it was. So when we mean no compromise is we mean there are enough gun laws on the books. There's hundreds and hundreds of gun laws that making more gun laws is not what we're about. Matter of fact, we would like to see them reduced. And mm -hmm. I know there'll be some flack about that, but there's proven statistics. And here's what bothers me the most is I don't know where some of these people get their statistics, but during my law enforcement career, I was also assigned to different task force teams with the federal government. I was on the U.S. Mm -hmm. Marshall Task Force team, FBI Task Force team. So I was privy to a lot of, um, you know, statistics and stuff like that through training. So all my stuff is backed up by, you know, statistically proven on what the FBI reports on each and every crime that every department has to file every year. Mm -hmm. And so when people get into this, like, oh, there's more people killed with an AR-15. That's the biggest lie and deception there is. There's more people killed with a small caliber handgun when mm -hmm. you put about the totality of guns than any rifle. So, you know, that's the thing that kind of gets me the most. I think a lot of people are uneducated when it comes to guns and gun ownership. And we can get into that because there's a it's a whole genre of it. But yeah, and, and, and do do hold that point, because I yeah. actually do want to ask you a very a, a little bit later on in the pod, a very specific question about yeah. when it comes to restrictions with with things like the AR-15 versus the handgun. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll put a pin in that. But I that was that was on my list of questions. So I, I definitely Absolutely. don't miss on that. So yeah. uh, so that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, kind of rolling back some of these different laws, some of these regulations and things like that. And then, you know, I know that you are the uh, the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific Regional Director, if I have Correct. that right. Uh, yes. So I'm curious in terms of, right, you know, obviously this is an, an organ focused podcast and we'll get into that in just a second, but you're managing kind of a bunch of uh, different states, obviously in a similar area. Uh, yeah. What are kind of some of the hot button issues? And, you know, you could, uh, we could of course talk about them in Oregon, but maybe about, you know, like, is there things you're working on in Washington or oh, Idaho yeah. as well? Yeah. I'm assuming probably a lot of things in California, just kind of based on that aspect, but uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm kind of assuming you're you got your hands a little bit in all those too. Yeah, I've got a I've got a tough region. Um, I've got New Mexico, Arizona. I do have Hawaii, Alaska, and then I've got Washington, Oregon, Nevada. So then I'm also the liaison in California. We actually have a guy that's that Sam Peretti's that takes care of the California all in of itself because there is such a vast. It was you know they're the number one in gun control as of right now. But Washington, we've got a big assault weapons ban that they're trying to pass there that is, it's probably going to get passed. Governor Inslee, he's a gun grabber, so he's going to go ahead and more likely sign it. Of course, Oregon and Washington are probably my two most uh, prioritized states right now because Hawaii, it's such a cultural, you know, they, they've never had the, the guns. So it's kind of the culture there is a lot different. But when you look at, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, it's a lot of like a tribal culture. And so it, it's hard to do a lot of works there because a lot of their Republicans are even for nobody owning guns. Um, Alaska holds it on, but my, my top priority is my Oregon and Washington people. And then my next one would be Nevada and Arizona because we've, we've seen that. And even in New Mexico, we dodged a big bullet, at, literally, you know, no, no pun intended, but the, uh, they were trying to pass an assault weapons ban there, and I have to give it up to the Dem uh, the lead House Democrat. He said, we're not going to waste our taxpayers' time and money into litigation when the U.S. Supreme Court has already decided 
that Bruin mm-hmm. says this. And they went ahead and shot it down. And, and I'll tell you, I was extremely impressed with those Democrats. Because what you have to understand is we, we don't dislike Democrats or Republicans. What we dislike is anyone trying to infringe on our constitutional rights. And, and that's where our no compromise comes in fact. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then uh, I'm just kind of curious of, you know, obviously you've probably spent uh, quite a bit of time in Oregon. You've probably spent quite a bit of time in Washington. Uh, yeah. To me, you know, growing up in Oregon, I mean, even in the area that I grew up in, which was the Portland area, right, which, you know, obviously uh, yes. uh, that, you know, kind of the hub of, of where most of the Democratic voters, that's generally the area I was I was born in. Uh yeah. I mean, Oregon's just always been interesting. And I mean, same with Washington in the sense of that, you know, obviously the states are a little bit more, I mean, I'd say on average left-leaning. I mean, I guess you could make the argument Oregon and Washington are purple states. I would say they're probably at very least soft blue states. I don't know if I'd call them like a hard blue state like Rhode Island or something like that. But uh, it just seems to have sort of an interesting gun culture in general where like you do have people who are, you know, moderate or or, you know, left-leaning who you know, probably disagree with me on the social issues, on economic issues. But then when it comes to firearms, it's uh, it's a little iffy, right? They're like, well, you know, my family owns a gun. You know, I grew up around guns and things like that. Uh, how has it been to you? You know, obviously you, you grew up in Tennessee. I'm not sure how much time you spent yeah. uh, kind of in the Pacific Northwest. But uh, like, what does that culture feel like to you when, you know, you're talking with activists or you're talking with Republicans or Democrats or whoever it might be, kind of when you're engaging on these issues. Just, yeah, just kind well, of curious like how it feels like to talk to people about yeah, this. Yeah, right and, and I'll know. tell you, I lived for about seven months in Bremerton, Washington. So uh, my wife is a nurse psychiatric practitioner and she worked for a company down there. So we stayed and actually lived in, in Washington for, oh, well, I guess it was almost probably about seven months. And absolutely a gorgeous state. Oh, and Oregon, exactly the same. These two are like, I I mean, I love Tennessee and I love our hills, but those Cascade Mountains and the Olympic (laughs) Mountains are off the hook. I'm telling you. So the the biggest thing that was that was that was kind of on my part is, you know, there's in in Bremerton, you have a heavy, you know, naval. They've got the naval bases there. So there was a lot of people that that I always get made fun of because they say I look like your quintessential gun guy, bald head, beard you know, big guy, but, and I'm like, no, no, trust me. If you're you're not watching this listeners on YouTube, you'll (laughs) obviously have to view the YouTube and you'll have to check out Bonnie's setup. He's got in the background. So if it's all right, but yeah, but you know, my, my beautiful wife is also somebody you wouldn't think would be a gun person. She's a very spiritual person. She, and I always, always told her she's the, the uh, butterfly riding the unicorn carrying an AR-15 because she believes in, our constitution. So the demographic though, I found that, you know, a lot of times when I would talk to people, you had the certain part of the left that were like, okay, well that's you, you do you. But then you had the extreme part and the extremist, they just hate you. They're, they're so full of hate and rage that, you know, like I wore an AR-15 breakdown shirt one time. And I literally in it, and it, it's sad that it's not there, but it was called a cash brewery that she actually went ballistic on me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, because I was wearing that shirt, she said that I was a racist and, and everything. I'm like, wow, you don't even know my family. I said my family comes from a mixed genre of, of you know, race backgrounds. And, I, and I'm, I'm just I'm thinking this is funny because that's the type of people I think you meet. You meet those hardcore group of the left. And by violence and by, I, I don't even call it bullying, they try to get their stuff through. And then you have the people that are really nice. They'll have a good discussion with you. They may not agree with guns. They may not think everybody should have an AR-15, but they're open to a good conversation. And then, of mm-hmm. course, you have the other demographic, which are the which is the majority of the state. You have those big populist states that kind of control the, the tempo. So, you know you have a lot of the people on the other side of the fence that are very much into freedom. Yeah. And then, yeah. And just, a, I think a, a good example of sort of that uh, I'll call, I'll call it a vibe because I've been seeing a lot of political <laughs> articles referencing vibes and feeling with vibes. So I'm going to call it a vibe yeah. Uh, yeah. to me. Measure 114, I thought actually embodied that really well in the sense of, right. I, I thought originally I, 
you know, we, uh, we write this newsletter. A lot of our listeners read the newsletters and I did an analysis section on 114. I thought this was going to pass totally blow the hole through the water. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, someone can fact check me on this number. I'm actually trying to fact check myself right now, but I believe that there was, uh, uh, close to, uh, somewhere between three to $5 million that was basically spent in favor of supporting, uh, measure 114 in Oregon, which was a ballot measure in 2022. Uh, and then I think in terms of opposition, uh, there was maybe like 200,000 from what I'm looking at expenditures right now, somewhere kind of in that ballpark opposing it. And of course this ballot measure, just looking at the results right now was decided by, uh, a little bit over one, 1.3%. So obviously very, very close, especially when you, you know, see how much money was spent on one side yeah. and how little, uh, money was spent on the other. So, uh, you know, you guys have obviously had quite a lot of involvement post vote on measure 114, but I think it'd be helpful yeah. for uh, our listeners to, could you just give us kind of the breakdown in terms of what, uh, what measure 114 did, uh, or is, you know, going to potentially do at some point and like, what are the key characteristics that, you know, what, what's kind of like the, the bottom line up front in terms of what the bill actually, or what the ballot measure actually did? Yeah, well, in, in, I, I like to try to put this into that the, the ballot measure, a lot of people just, a lot of people try to say that it was an assault weapons ban. Okay. And we can go on the record all day long. There is no such thing as an assault weapon. And just to put it into context in 2018, I I think I'll pull old out from my police days. There was like 475 people killed with a claw hammer. Okay. So at that, that particular year, there was more people killed with a hammer than there was uh, this so-called assault rifle. The problem is you can see the one behind me, that gun will never hurt a soul until an evil gets behind that and puts it into it. So they tried to play 114 off as a assault weapon to go after the AR-15, the AK-47 type guns, because they feel that people didn't need them. But the hidden part of it is all the fruits and potatoes that are in that meal where you get into certain shotguns, certain uh, rifles that have to have certain modifications, uh, stamping. Okay, what people don't realize is that there, and, and this law is still coming. We mm -hmm. see it in SB 348, okay? That, that law has been voted on, passed, it's going to the governor, and it's basically 114, but even worse. So what 114 was by banning weapons and taking them out of law-abiding citizens, then the, the problem is, is that now they thought, well, okay, we didn't win it this way because as you know, GOA put, filed a lawsuit and we actually got to stay. That'll be coming up for trial. I think it is in September. And, mm, okay. you know, so that's going to be an interesting part on that. But the, you know, what, what gets me is the anti-gun people on the left side, decided to go after litigation and just try to pass another ban, which, as you know, there's a, quite a few states right now in litigation. Hey, I'll bring Illinois up. You know, there's a lawsuit going in the in the Seventh, seventh Circuit. So, you know, we, we've already had the U.S. Supreme Court say that these are unconstitutional grabs of your rights. And, and mm -hmm. the right to bear arms is plain and simple, right to bear arms. But some of these measures and what people don't understand some of these laws like on SB 348 if a pistol can take a magazine over 10 rounds even if you only possess a 10 round magazine that gun is banned so let's mm. take a Glock 19 i've got a Glock 19 in my gun safe right here it's got a 20 round magazine in it now i could take that out and put a 10 round magazine and quote unquote be a compliant with their caps that they're putting on but because that gun can accept a bigger one, it is long, it is banned. So they've anted up on measure 14, 114, and they're trying to pass even more. And, you know, I've always told everybody when I've done podcasts in the past, when I've done radio, I've never arrested a law abiding citizen in 30 years of law enforcement. And I know that's a funny, that's, and, and it's a hidden joke because uh, people, yeah, people <laughs> sit there and they're like, wait a minute. I was like, okay. I was like uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I made you think about it, but that, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I have yeah. an extensive gun collection and none of them hurt anybody because I'm a responsible gun owner, you know? And so, you know, when we get to 114, I am, I am, 
I was not very optimistic when we first put our lawsuit in. Um, we have mm-hmm. a great team, legal team. And I'm going to tell you, it's pro- in my opinion, and I'm biased, it's, it's the best in the nation because they, they live and breathe the, the, the Second Amendment. So when they put together our lawsuit, the, you know, there were several other lawsuits filed on 114, but ours actually- Yeah, yeah there was quite a few. Yeah, that, yeah. well, that's one thing. There, I know there was quite a few of them filed. I believe the NRA also filed the suit. Yeah. There was a couple others, but it was, it was really uh, the GOA one that actually stuck, basically. Yeah, and we did get issued that stay. And then, of course, it was appealed and we got issued the stay to stay until the trial date. So- and, you know, mm-hmm. we work we work really close with other two A organizations, too. Like we work with the Oregon Firearms Federation hand in hand. Um, Kevin over there is a great, great patriot that is fighting for Oregon's or the Oregon people. And, you know, we'll work with them and try to help out each other because, you know, we may have somebody that is a member there, but not a member here or vice versa. Or if they need to get some information out, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're really on the pulse on trying to help you guys. So. You know, he goes in on their website, and that's the Oregon's Firearm Federation. You can look it up. But he even breaks down the the laws even better than what I do. And because he's living, breathing in that state where I have seven or eight other states that I have to kind of, you know, I get involved with. And there's a lot going on in those seven states. So, yeah. And and so, so Monty, one question I, I had with you, and I said this on a previous podcast, I think we published two or three before this, is that. Uh, regardless of where you are at on Measure 114, the lawsuit the GOA was able to pull off was just, I mean, frankly, it was an incredible political maneuver, right? In the yeah. sense of that something was passed, right? And then basically there was a strategic, you know, behind the scenes essentially to be able to stop the specific measure from being implemented. A court will then essentially decide at some point uh, whether this will go forward. And to me, what was so interesting about this is that, uh, you know, I've always thought of groups, let's say like GOA, let's say yours, let's say mom demand action, right? Let's take any sort of activist group is that, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, your primary focus might have been saying, let's go find, you know, all of the guys and gals who get really fired up about the Second Amendment. Let's tell them to call their members of Congress or state reps, you know, et cetera. And I'm sure that you're you're probably still doing that. Uh, but this new sort of legal angle of this, I think, is just uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, the, the right word I'm not looking for is clever, but it, it frankly is extraordinarily clever. And again, let's say yeah. vice versa, an anti-gun group had stopped a pro-gun measure from getting passed in Texas or something. Again, still like it, it, it's very clever in terms of how this is working. So my, my question is a little bit broader than Oregon, right? But it's like, is this a kind of new strategy that, you know, gun rights organizations or even not, you know, g- groups that, you know, oppose some of the policies you do, like bombs demand action. Are more of these battles now taking place in court than they were before? Or is that, or do you think they're just kind of getting more attention? Like, do you yeah, no. what you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely 100%. Everything is a lot more in the court systems. And I think as our U.S. Supreme Court has came up with Bruin and Heller, and they've said, they, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has drawn the line in the sand and said, hey, look, these, this is where you can't go. And then we're seeing the states say, you know what, we don't care what the U.S. Supreme does, and we're going to do what we want to anyways. So those court battles is where is is one of the leading things. And that's what people don't realize when, when, and what we need to do is, is 2A organizations, whether it's GOA, the uh, Oregon Firearms Federation, you know, any other one, we have to start working together instead of against each other. Now, we don't have to have the same policies, right? Um, If your organization feels like, ah, we'll compromise a a bump stock versus versus this, then that's up to your organization. But what we can be clear on is what the Second Amendment is for and no more further attacks, no more limitations and restrictions. So we're fighting these in court, which we know is expensive and we know that the, the anti-gunners like your mom's demand action and a bunch of those people have a lot of wealthy Soros-backed money and those type of people that have unlimited funds. So, you know, when people ask me all the time, you know, well, what can we do? Litigation is expensive. Our lawyers do this at, at the rock bottom rates. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm impressed, but 
the actual cost of litigation is there. Join these organizations, join your state organization, join GOA, make sure that you're, we don't, we don't ask for a lot. We have a $25 a year membership. And if that is not worth your second amendment rights, then I don't know what is. And it's like, I've told everybody, every single gun owner, if you possess a firearm, whether it's for self-protection, hunting, or whatever you choose, your freedom is, you should belong to a state organization and a national organization, because those are the ones that are, we're, we're sitting here constantly monitoring what they're trying to slide in. I mean, a couple of years ago, New York tried to slide in a, a magazine cap in a, in a safety. Uh, it, it was labeled uh, safety and stuff like that. It had all kinds of crazy stuff. And then in the middle of it was a, a nice little, uh, we're, we're limiting your rounds for self-defense. So, mm. Yeah, no, it's just been, it's, uh, you know, to me, and I think it's, no matter where you are on the side of the issue, it's been interesting to see. I think people have clearly, well, not, not entirely, right, but they've really ditched the federal effort of this, right, in terms of people yeah. just think gun control or maybe even more gun rights, basically. It's, it's not, the action is not happening at the federal level. It's like, we're going to the states and we're also going to engage in litigation. So I just think yeah. it's been... Uh, it's and been see, really interesting to me how this is, you know, especially yeah, with this the, issue, I feel like in particular, right, it's really, and, you know, playing out all over the place. So, yeah. And like when we were talking about ballot 114, ballot measure 114, um, I'm getting a lot of phone calls right now, GOA, because this, this SB 348, once it's passed and signed, then it eliminates a lot of uh, uh, thousands of guns that the people of Oregon cannot possess. And the thing that we have to look at is, okay, well, it's time to take a stand because now we're taking law abiding citizens in, in, in all, everywhere. there's people in Portland that have guns and I'm not talking just the criminals. I mean, even, even law abiding citizens, actually, there might be a few there that have them, you know, they're no longer going to be able to possess that to protect themselves. And I've been in Portland and I can promise you this after law enforcement, I have a, I can carry in all 50 States. And I can promise you, I carry a gun in Portland because Portland, Seattle, all these places, they're violent. I mean, there's stuff going on there that, that, you know, criminals have guns. We have open borders right now. There's illegal firearms coming across like by the tons. You mm -hmm. know, you talk to the border patrol guys, you know, it's drugs and guns. That's what's coming over because the criminals, they're not going to follow the, the, the laws. You can take away any kind of gun from me or you. But the criminal's still going to have an AK-47 because he got it from across the border, you know, and that's what people don't realize. So mm -hmm. the litigation part of it, and I've been contacted a lot about what are we going to do when 348 goes in? Are we going to sue them? Well, we're dealing with the ninth district, the ninth, the federal circuit. Now, we know we can't touch the state courts because the state courts are corrupt. And I'm sorry, the, the judges there are for whoever's whoever's in control. And we know who the governor is. So. The Ninth Circuit has a 54 and 0 against gun, 2A rights. So they vote gun control every time. But we have similar cases that are going on in the Second, second Circuit and the Seventh Circuit that mm. that may be the wave that rides across and takes care of my people out in the West. And I'll, and I'll, really? and I'll, okay. yeah, and I'll explain to you why. So we know that um, Thomas and Alito have already smacked the second circuit and told them, hey, look, we're watching you guys. What you're doing, we've already said, is a violation and infringement on the Second Amendment. So what that's going to do, if we talk about the, the circuit, so let's say the, the second circuit doesn't make the correct choice that follows by the U.S. Supreme what's going to happen there is it's going to go straight to the U S Supreme court. And obviously they've already ruled on this stuff. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to pull it away. But what you, what they don't want is the ninth circuit to split a decision and go totally against what the second circuit did. So if the second circuit says this is a violation and unconstitutional, and then the ninth circuit says, no, it's constitutional. It automatically goes to the U S Supreme court because they can't have mm, two. Yeah. They can't have two circuits saying this is constitutional. This is unconstitutional. They can't have it. So, so, so let me just make sure I, ha I have you right there, Monty. So, yeah. So the, the strategy is, uh, and you know, just just to make sure I have this right, you will push this lawsuit onto the onto the Ninth Circuit Supreme Court with SB uh, uh, three three four eight, basically. 
there'll be a very similar lawsuit, I imagine, to another piece of legislation in a different circuit court. Those two courts may basically rule differently, which will then push this up to the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court, you know, if it does make the you know more conservative decision, basically, that could actually then override the SB 348, uh, even though that was also enacted, basically, or soon to be enacted by the Oregon State Legislature. Do I have that right? Well, there's one little one little difference on it. We're mm. looking at a lawsuit, but we're also understanding that we can't do it in the state because we know how the state, the state, the state, I'm just going to be honest with you, the, the corrupts, the corruptness in that. So we have to look at the federal end of the lawsuit. We don't want to. Mm-hmm. We don't want to jump too quick. We are talking to our, our legal team, and they are deciding whether we need to go and try to bring in a federal lawsuit. But we don't want a federal lawsuit in the Ninth Circuit because we want this. We've okay. already got them active in the second and in the seventh. So we want them to make a decision because we think once they make the right decision, the constitutional decision, because they're being watched by the U.S. Supreme Court, then the Ninth Circuit will have to rule on their behalf because they don't want to split it. Because if they Mm -hmm. split it, then it goes directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. We already know what they've ruled, right? The U.S. Supreme Court's not going to go against what what they've already ruled because that would make them look like they don't know what they're doing. Did did that clear it up? Yeah, no, it's just it's uh, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are uh, not scratching their head and uh, but we'll it's hard. Confused, but like, no, I just I just think it's, you know, so interesting. Right. We focus so much on the you know, again, you are a grassroots funded. I'm, I'm sure you have some major donors and major backers, but basically a grassroots organization. We are heavily engaged in litigation and legal process. Which again, I'm assuming Moms Demand Action, those other groups are as well. I just think it's it's so interesting how. Uh, like the types of advocacy have changed in terms of kind of the, again, I'm sure you're doing a lot of the grassroots, the door knocking, things like that, but how this new kind of litigation, I mean, that's a, you know, again, very, very well thought out legal strategy that you'd basically yeah. just conveyed to us. So yeah. Uh, and they, and they go hand in hand. So, you know, you still have to be out there and shaking hands and talking to people because those are the members who actually fund and enable us to do the lawsuits. But then the lawsuits, like 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 what you said, it's a cat and mouse game, you know, because the left's been doing it, and so us on the other side, we're doing it as well. So you're you're the conservatives have to fight in the courts just like the other people do, and that's what's and it is it is a cat and mouse game because you know just like moms demand action, you know they'll file lawsuits and stuff like that, and and then it's just it's constant stuff. But the 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 biggest thing boils down to is what the U.S. Supreme Court rules and says it either is a violation of a constitutional right or it's mm-hmm. not. And, you know, that's where we have to get to and that's where we strive. But the cat and mouse is, okay, you have you have the Ninth Circuit, which is where Oregon, Washington, California are, and they 100% vote all gun control. They're 54 and zero on their decisions. So they've mm-hmm. never voted a pro-gun bill or anything like that. So we're not optimistic if we have to go into that circuit, but mm. we've won battles in the second, the seventh, and we know we win battles in the fifth because that's where our, our uh, in Texas, because that's where our pistol, our uh, pistol brace lawsuits um, in. So there, you know, it is, it's a very strategic, it's a very, you know, you've got to be on your game. You've got to know where these are going and you've got to know what, basically what I'm saying is you got to know your audience, right? You don't want to mm-hmm. take a pro-gun lawsuit to the circuit that that never that never's decided on a, on one, you know they're always against them. Yeah, no, th- thank you for the the very detailed explanation. I'm super yeah. super interesting. I'm sure the audience uh, appreciate that. Uh, okay, so wanted to move gears, uh, do yeah. a, a little bit of rapid hit, just kind of on uh, a number of different uh, issues related to firearms. And actually, the specific one I wanted to rebring up was the. The handgun versus the you know assault rifle, AR-15, et cetera. So yeah. and I, I actually somewhat asked this to mom demands action, and I'm kind of surprised that more people who are in favor of gun regulation, this is not the approach. But I mean, you are 100% correct that statistically, the vast majority of homicides that happen with firearms are due to handguns. Like that's just, that's not a disputed fact. You can look that up anywhere. There's probably not even a single state, I would imagine, where 
a rifle is higher when it comes to homicides than what it is with the handgun. I mean, it, of course, it makes sense. Handguns are easier to conceal. I'm assuming it's also easier to get an illegal handgun. Uh, you don't generally see people walking around in you know parts of the city with an AR-15 or with an AK-47. Uh, and I'm actually curious from, and you know, maybe not uh, giving advice to your opponents, but just kind of a question. Yeah. Why don't folks call for more handgun regulation? Like I have never seen uh, either, my, and maybe they have, I just haven't seen it, but I've never seen anyone or any laws put forward to really say, we need to ban certain types of handguns or we need you know, specific restrictions on them. It's always focused on AR-15s, AK-47, that class of weapon. Uh, why why don't they focus on handguns more in terms of well, if that and and, and I can and I can tell you that and it's it's you got to look at the big picture okay why does people want to disarm a a country so how the 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 what I you know we I know that we're a two party system you know we're Democrats and Republicans right now but if you look at what I always call the anti gun left the radical left okay. And that's who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who don't want any guns in this world. Their agenda is to ban all weapons. Okay. They want socialism, which people don't understand. Go look up your socialistic countries. It's proven fact. You don't want to be in a social country because that is, it's just like a communist country. There's just different ways it happens. One's voted in, one's taken. So what they focus on is the fact that the, the, the second amendment, is a rail rail regulated militia. And that militia is you and me as people, right? That's our God-given rights that that we can we can right to bear arms. They don't want us to have the AR-15s, the AKs, the 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 what they call assault weapons. They're actually just a semi-automatic weapon. I have behind me an AR-15, okay? This rifle behind me was in my patrol car for over 20 something years and I have been on used it during my SWAT team. I was fortunate enough to get to purchase the weapon. Of course, it's not full auto. I had to put it back down to its original configuration. But the, the misconception is that this is such a dangerous weapon. But I have in my gun safe a gun that shoots the exact same bullet in a bolt action. It's a Savage. It shoots the same thing. It holds 10 rounds. It shoots 10 rounds. The The problem is, is that we, we've demonized the the guns and it is you are correct it's it's a hundred percent statistical fact handguns kill more people but they want to go after the guns first and they're going after the ar because you can bet your money if they ever succeeded in getting the ar banned let's say it's it's nationwide it's illegal to own the next step is they're coming for different rifles shotguns pistols they will come for them. They will not stop. We have seen this from the radical left. That's their that's their agenda. That's what they spend so much money on. They're just trying to get that one fruit before they try to get the whole tree. That's why we fight so hard at GOA on no compromise, and we don't back down. We're not giving up on this on this platform. The AR-15 is one of the most popular rifles for any time of hunting, sporting. Um, and, and, you know, and when I call by sporting, it's even great for home defense. But if you look across the board, most people use a shotgun for home defense. They'll use a pistol. I happen to be one of those people that a shoulder fired AR-15 is a lot more comfortable for my wife, for me, and even for a child that's been properly trained. So, but that's what they do. They won't stop at this rifle. Oops, sorry, that rifle. They're going to keep going until they disarm the country. And I can tell you, I can tell you right now, knives have killed more people than that AR-15. You can look at yeah, that. And that that makes sense, at least kind of kind of how you framed it to me. But still, just just the general question, yeah, like why why not go after the handguns? Like, is that is that is there like legal barriers to that that maybe it's easier to go after rifles or again it just I I have never seen a campaign yeah. where folks say. We need to get handguns off the street, basically, right? And to me, yeah, and, and like, I think logically uh, that would make more sense, right? Like if we, yeah, if we do and, I, and I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. There's more people killed with a handgun, but I think what it goes down to is you got to understand these anti-gun left people. They're smart. They're not. They're not ignorant people. They know that if they were to switch gears and go towards the handguns, 
there's more handguns out there than there are, let's say, people who like AR-15s. I've got Democratic mm-hmm. friends right now that have a Glock 19 in, at their home for home defense, but they would never own an AR-15. So if they go after a handgun, they're going to start upsetting a lot of people on their own side. Whereas they mm-hmm. kind of have that feeling like, oh, it's okay to own a shotgun, but we don't think you should own an AR-15. So that's why they focus I, on their I do attention. have many friends on the left who that is actually where their political position is. They And you know what? I'm totally fine with that. And AR-15. But yeah, they own shotguns, they own handguns and things. So yeah. that was kind of what I thought. Just maybe yeah. that wasn't politically as feasible just because, yeah, as you said, so many people own the handgun compared to rifle as well. That's Correct. used more for home defense. So, uh, well, okay. And you, that, and you got to look sense. at this too, just a real quick snippet on it. You got to look at this too. You know, look at when people are out there and they're actually carrying their firearm for self-protection. I don't take an AR-15. I take, you know, I take a, I take a pistol. That's what I carry. I would say 99.9% of the time when I'm out and about, I'm carrying a pistol. There's very rare times that I take my AR-15. Most of them are at the house and in my gun safe and locked up. Or mm. when I'm home, it's outside. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then uh, ne- next thing I wanted to ask you about uh, school shootings, school safety in general. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it seems like, I mean, everyone experiences this. There's, you know, some sort of school shooting. I don't, I don't know the exact frequency of them. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, any of these school shootings is, is absolutely horrible, but you know, absolutely. Uh, it seems actually really on both sides too, in the sense of that something will happen. I mean, I know you're in Tennessee. I know a terrible shooting just happened there. I believe we yeah. also had a shooting at a, a college somewhere. I'm blanking out. I don't remember the exact name, but you know, basically folks on the, on the left will call for more gun control or regulation, background checks, things like that. And then some folks on the right will, you know, sort of say we should arm teachers or we should do that. Uh, how does GOA approach the issue of kind of school safety, school shootings? Like what, are, like if you guys could implement, you know, kind of ideal policy reforms from your perspective, like what, yeah. you know, what are some examples of that? And then my follow-up question to that is, are there any states that have actually implemented some of the policies you've recommended? Like if you guys think we should arm the teachers or maybe every school yeah. needs a school resource officer. Oh, we did that in Alabama or we did that in, you know, New yeah. Hampshire, or whatever it is, uh, really, really curious to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and this is probably one of my my fortes um, in law enforcement. I was an active shooter instructor, so I was one of the, I actually helped in in especially in the state of Tennessee. Different uh, departments come up like training our SROs on how to react, training our officers on how to react. Now we all know that the national shooting that happened. Those officers were heroes. They were there very quickly. Um, I think it was under 13 minutes where the threat was neutralized. But what you have to understand is that that's not always what happens. You know, sometimes there is a longer delay. Okay, but I am a big advocate, and this gets a lot of controversy with my police friends, of arming teachers. Because I think the way that we have in our school systems right now, like, let me explain to you. Let me take um, one of my local in the department in uh, my local high school that was there. One of our principals was an ex-Navy SEAL. Why in the world would you not want him armed with a handgun? He could probably take you out with his eyelashes, right? I mean, this guy is a weapons expert. He is good under stress and different stuff like that. So we don't have to arm every teacher the sheer fact that we quit making it a soft target, and we also know that the, the terrorist that, that shot the school in, in Nashville, she had a, a, a manifesto that the reason why she attacked it was because it was a soft target. So we have to harden mm. our most precious places. Now, I love what uh, certain people said. You can't walk into CNN. They're guarded by guns. You can't go to CNN headquarters and walk right through the door, walk right onto the broadcast stage. They have armed security there. Well, why don't our kids? And I had a teacher tell me in a very respectful way, she goes, well, I shouldn't have to carry a gun. And I said, you know what? That's the world we're in today. That's the evil. Our mental illness is at an all-time high. Drugs are at an all-time high. Evil is at an all-time high. And unfortunately, they're attacking our school systems. Now, some of the things, there's places in Texas 
that have signs up that says the average response for a police is 20 minutes. Our teachers carry guns mm -hmm. and we will kill you if you try to hurt our teachers. That's pretty open. We know that there has never been a, a school shooting where teachers were armed. That's something that we need to talk about. Why are we not talking about stuff that works instead of taking guns out of mine in your hands that aren't going to do a school shooting? I would never harm a child. I would give my life for a child. So why are we not talking about that? Why are we not talking about the solutions? And then uh, uh, now I know what somebody's going to bring up. Well, what if that teacher has a firearm and the police come in? Well, let me explain to you something that's a, that you can pull it up and, and check it. 98% of the time during an active shooter, when the shooter is met with force, they do one of two things. They commit suicide or they are taken out by the force. 1% run. 1%. So we know by statistically proven facts that if the teacher in Nashville, the principal, the hero, if she would have been armed with a handgun and trained. Now, a lot of departments offer free training if they want to do it. My apartment did. I offered to train teachers. I did not, would not charge a penny. But if she would have went out to that terrorist shooter and, for, and met her with a firearm, no child would have been dead. No teachers would have been gone. Now, could she have still lost her life with the shooter? Yes. But she went and tried to stop a shooter with her bare hands and nothing else. Why not wow. give her a chance? So that is a hero. Now, now think about this. Look at her heroism. Now, can you imagine if she would have been trained on a firearm? She could have stopped anybody getting killed. You know, it's been proven that she was in a defensive mark. So it is working if we arm teachers. Now, uh, one thing that Tennessee did, um, Governor Lee, even though I don't believe in a lot of what he's doing because of the red flag laws and stuff like that, but he is putting in that every school in the state of Tennessee is going to have a, a SRO, an armed person, and they're even looking into training military people. One of my biggest mm -hmm. thing is we have veterans that would give their life for, they gave their, they gave lives for us, for our freedoms. There is no bigger, higher, more patriot than our than our military. Instead of sending billions of dollars to over to Ukraine and watch it just disappear, why don't we hire these people, outfit them, and put them into our schools? They're excellent with weapons. They're proficient with weapons. They act incredibly great under stress, and they are a positive role model to our kids as well. You know, we don't have to outfit them in full turnout gear. We can put them in a polo. We can give them access to the weapons they, they feel comfortable with. They don't have to walk around like the National Guard inside of school. Our SROs mm -hmm. don't. I mean, in my county, our SROs, our SROs wear, wear uh, you know, polos and khakis. But yeah. they also have access to shoulder-fired weapons at a quick access, and they also carry handguns. So it's a deterrent. And here's the thing. If you do the teachers the same way and the teachers are carrying concealed, then no one even knows they have a weapon. There's ways we can do it and we can make the school safer. And we also know to, to, to help with the part, we have sirens, we have different uh, audio, audio things. There is ways to make sure that the teachers and the students know that police are coming in. And we've got different ways of doing that. My gosh, we've got camera systems that people can pull up on their phones. And you know, and a lot of times, most of those teachers would be sitting in their classroom with their kids protected, pointing a gun at the door to where if a shooter come in that door, she could eliminate that shooter instead of throwing a can of soup beans at her, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's a, uh, no, that, that's, yeah, no, that's a, uh, a number of different positions. That's a, thanks for, for outlining that for us. I did want to ask one thing, which I don't believe was relevant for the Tennessee shooting, but I know has been relevant for past shootings, which okay. is uh, uh, not necessarily background checks in the same, and again, you know, that was one thing I wanted to ask you about. I know yeah. sometimes folks will say you do not need to take uh, any sort of background check to purchase a firearm. I've purchased five firearms in my life. I've in a number of different states, every time I've gone through an FBI background check, I'm not aware of any process or anywhere you can purchase a firearm legally without getting some sort of state or FBI background check. 
One thing I did want to ask, though, is that, uh, and these are especially disheartening to me, is that you hear stories with some of these mass shooters, whether at school or whatever, where they went through that FBI background check. And because of a faulty system or poor infrastructure, whatever, they should not have actually been able to purchase the firearm, but they still were basically because of the system. I wanted to ask you, like, what what actually is that like FBI background check? What is yeah. like what is that process? And then also, I can't imagine it's that expensive or that difficult to just update this computer <laughs> system uh, for, well, we'll for see, lack of a better word. But like what, yeah. what what could you just walk us through that process? Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. see, here's the thing, and that and, and you hit it right on the, the, the thing. There's only select ways that you could quote unquote purchase a gun without a background check. Okay. And that is, let's say I was to sell a gun in the state of Tennessee to, let's say I sold it to my cousin or my brother that I knew wasn't a convicted felon because we you're still supposed to ask him. So, but the, the overwhelming majority, I would say it's probably in the high 90%. Everybody does a background check. I purchased a firearm as we speak today and I went through a background check. It was ran through the system. I'm not flagged because of that. They do a thorough check. What we're missing the key is, it's not the background check that's 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 helping these people because you're right. There's been shooters that have went and bought guns. But you know the one thing it's missing on there is their mental health. They won't put it on there. So if you wanted to make a, if you wanted to make, you know, but we, we get into their, their, their uh, HIPAA and stuff like that. But people that are very, very un, unfunctional with mental, mental, mental status, mm-hmm. they're the ones, you know, they don't want to put that onto a background system. They don't want to bring in that stuff because then just like the one that shot over here, you know, that would have been caught. She would have been flagged. She has got this kind of mental illness. She's incapacitated where she can't really function in public or whatever it had been. And I think that's the slippery slope that people don't want to go down and they keep trying to say we need more background checks. Well, it doesn't do any good if we're not looking at the mental illness part and see. Mm. And that's what we're, we're dealing with. You can't tell me with an honest conscience that anyone who shoots up a school in innocent kids doesn't have a severe mental issue. And I will stand behind that 100 percent because it takes a very evil person to commit a mass murdering anywhere on an innocent person. It doesn't matter whether they're adults, they're children. But when our children are involved, that is a sick, evil person with with uh, with mental illness that does not make them be able to fit in society. And, you know, it, it's a it's a it's a huge thing. And, it, and it's you know, we're seeing the evil that's produced from this mental illness. And that's like our last, I think the last five shootings have been, they've, they've all recognized as transgender. So why is the violent outreach not, wh- why don't they take their, their violent outreach, I guess I would say, and try to, try to do positive, to bring positive on what they're trying to get across instead of going and shooting up a school with innocent kids. To, and, and then people wanna condone Well, that's what that person's been pushed. Well, I can rebut that very simple. I don't like my freedoms being taken away. You'll never see me shoot up a school because I love people and I love this country. But I see freedoms being taken away from people on a daily basis. But I'm a good person, so I'm not going to do any evil, you know. And I think that's where we're missing the bucket is the background checks ain't going to do anything because mental illness is not reported or severe mental illness. Okay, and then Monty, and thank you again so much, so much for your time for the episode. There was one other thing I wanted to ask you about uh, before we let you go, which is uh, open carry. And uh, there is a group of, uh, for example, the former Baker City Mayor Carrie McQuiston and her, I believe, a couple, either one former state legislator, maybe I just made that up, but they're putting forward a ballot measure uh, in 2024 to. Uh, allow for, I believe it's constitutional open carry in the state of Oregon. Uh, my my question is actually not necessarily about the ballot measure, but uh, uh, obviously I'm a very pro gun guy, uh, and I don't I don't actually think open carry should be illegal. But 
my actual question is like, what is a case besides of a law enforcement officer where open carry is actually necessary or useful? And, uh, and like you know, specifically, and, you know, I feel that like I personally do not like open carry protests because I think it scares people who are, you know, maybe on the fence with the issue or very hesitant. Like it's especially when, you know, folks will go outside of a capital or something like that. I mean, totally respect folks' right to be able to do that. That's totally their choice. I, I just generally think it's not. Like again, as a pro gun guide, I don't necessarily yeah. think it helps win folks over to the cause. But like, what is an actual besides law enforcement? That obviously totally makes sense here. Maybe if you're like fishing or you're hunting or whatever, is there any actual like use case really for open carry? But of course, there's the protecting the constitutional right, which is I'm yeah. sure part of the argument that you'll make. But like, is there an instance where that would actually be useful or necessary? Kind of like, kind of walk me through that. Yeah, that's, I'll tell you what, that is an excellent question, man. Kudos to you for bringing this up because a lot of people don't ask this. And there, there are cases where people carrying in the open deters a crime. In other words, um, I'm in a convenience store. I have my gun in the open. I happen to walk by somebody that may rob it. That thought of, wow, wait a minute, this guy may try to shoot me. Maybe I'll go down here and try to rob something else. So sometimes I think in the open carry mind, it's a deterrent. Now, if we're speaking on a personal issue, I never open carry anything because I prefer to have that element of surprise. Okay. And I also, yeah, that's, that's what I've heard from like, yeah. you know, I got a lot of buddies who are, you know, yeah. super, pro, you know, that's like, I would never open carry because, well, you know, unless they're hunting or whatever, because they, that's yeah. the same you know, element of surprise sort of thing. Absolutely. Uh, but see, here's the, here's the biggest problem with this. I think it should be an open carry. I think everybody should be able to have the choice to open carry or conceal carry. But see, they want to think, and what I mean by this is the anti-gun left, they want to think that if you're concealed carrying, it's more dangerous to do that. And it's actually not. It's actually safer to concealed carry than open carry. But some of these states, like even like Arizona, they'll let you open carry in Arizona, but you have to get a, a <laughs> license to conceal it. And I'm like, people... It is more in my in, in my law enforcement opinion, me carrying, I would rather have it hid out of sight, out of mind than to have it hanging off my hip and somebody be able to attack me from behind or try to come up and disarm me because I have had that happen in my law mm -hmm. enforcement because they know where the target's at. So well, well, tell me too, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. actually, I may just be making this up, but I think I write is that I do know you need a permit in Oregon to concealed carry, but I do believe yes. there's at least a number of counties across the state that you can open carry. And that's Correct. like, that's totally fine. Yeah. To me, that's always just been shocking, basically, right? In terms yeah, of Yeah, they should go hand uh, in hand. It should be your choice to carry however you yeah, choose you to. think you think it'd be concealed yeah. over the, uh, you know, sort of, it's, it's and, yeah, and, that's and very, one thing, very confusing to me. But. Yeah, and one thing real quick, I know what we've always said in GOA, your rights should not have stipulations. You should not have to pay for them. You should not have to have training. But as an organization, we believe as a responsible gun owner, be trained proficient with your weapon. Because if you have to use it, you don't want to end up taking an innocent life trying to save an innocent life. So we do believe in training. And there are lots of good people out there doing superb training with concealed, open, and everything. And I, I push people, go find those people, especially our females that are carrying. There's female groups that they can get involved in. So they don't have to be around a bunch of guys that they don't feel comfortable with. And, you know, get that training, you know, be a be an accountable, uh, a good gun user. But we have to get these states to quit saying, well, we'll say OK to open carry, but not conceal because they go hand in hand. It's your choice as what your right is. And I'm a, I agree with you. If you ever see me, you're not going to know where my guns at. And, you know, that's just me. Now, touching on the open rally guns, I think where that caught steam is showing that a vast amount of people. Hundreds of people can join up, have AR-15 strapped to their back, and no one be shot or killed. And I think that that's the optic they're trying to use. Like, hey, come walk around with us. It's not scary. I did a 2A rally in Arizona um, a couple months back in February, and there was thousands of guns out open displayed, ARs, AKs. I, I mean, I think even a guy had a 50 caliber, and not one single person was, was hurt, 
shot, maimed, or nothing. And I think that's what they're trying to get across is, listen, these guns in responsible hands are the safest thing ever. You put anything into an evil hand, whether it's explosives, whether it's a car, whether it's a knife, a hammer, an AR-15, a pistol, anybody can do evil things. It just takes a means. We've seen people run through parades with cars and kill, kill lots of people. So if you were to take away every gun, but magically disappear, there's still going to be guns killing people. You watch and see if I'm not right. If they enact this SB 348 and they do away with a lot of people's rights, the legal citizens, the, the Americans that are there, the patriots, you're still going to have gun violence in the city of Portland. You're still going to have gun violence in, in, in the, in the crime ridden areas because gun control never helps criminal statistics. You can look at California, number one in mass shootings, number one in gun control right now. Look at Chicago, very heavy gun control, number one in shootings. In 436 kids lost their life last year in Chicago from illegal people having illegal guns. But we do nothing. We don't talk about that stuff. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's something I actually mentioned on the episode with Bombs Demand Action as well. So yeah. no, that's, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, yeah. Well, Monty, thank you so much again for your time and for you know, talking about Measure 114 litigation, which I've become uh, <laughs> more obsessed and interested <laughs> with, plus the rapid uh, kind of fire yeah. of all the uh, major pressing issues when it comes to yeah. firearms. So before I let you go, uh, if folks, you know, uh, uh, have questions for you or want to learn more about GOA or, you know, maybe take a look at kind of some of the, you know, the gun facts and statistics or, you yeah. know, that you were talking about. Uh, where would they go to uh, get that information? Yeah, you can always go to our home website. We have a very active site. It's gunowners.org. Uh, feel free to go on there. You'll have each one of your regional directors out there that you can reach out to personally if you have any questions. And you can always join GOA for that $25 a year and know that your money's going to fight for your Second Amendment rights. And, you know, we're very we're very active people. So, we get back in touch with our constituents. We we try to work with people and, you know, we're free to answer any questions. And again, Alex, you've been a great host and, you know, appreciate you having the opportunity to have me on. Awesome. Well, yeah, well, thank you again, Monty, so much for joining us and everybody. Thanks for listening. Uh, please make sure to subscribe and also go check us out on YouTube. So, uh, and as Monty said, you can see uh, his beard and you can see he's got quite the, <laughs> quite the pro gun office set up uh, in the background as well. So uh, thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you in the next episode. See you.